When our summer series on the book of Genesis began, you may remember we witnessed how God created the whole world out of nothing. Now here we are several weeks into the series and God is still creating things out of nothing. Today we're going to witness how God created a nation out of nothing. Let me explain what I mean. We'll start with Abram. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. So God wants to create a nation that will be his people that will follow and worship him as their God. So what does God start with? Abraham, a pagan. But wait, it gets better. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. So God is going to build a nation with a pagan man and a barren woman. Not to mention the fact that Abram's 75 and Sarai is 65 at the time. How in God's creation can he create a nation out of this couple? And why in God's creation would he create a nation out of this couple? Well, here's the answer to show that God's salvation story is not about Abram and Sarai. It's about his grace and mercy toward a fallen humanity. Today what we're going to see is how what God promises to Abraham, and then we're going to see how Abraham responds to God's promises to him. And in the process, what we're going to find ultimately is how Jesus fits into this story and how you and I fit into the story as well. So let's take a look at this character named Abraham. One of the things we see right away is that he had deep roots, didn't he? That scripture that I just read from Joshua 24 says that he and his ancestors had deep roots in a land beyond the Euphrates River. And he had no plans of leaving that land. That land had been his family's home for generations. Now, some of you maybe can understand what it means to have deep roots. And the deeper those roots go, you know the harder it is to be uprooted and go somewhere else, right? But some of you may not understand deep roots because maybe throughout your life you've moved from place to place and never really felt rooted. Well, today what we see is here's Abram who knew what deep roots were all about, but God's gonna uproot him and God's gonna have him go somewhere else. God gives him a very clear command. He says, go from your country, your people, and your father's household. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's time for Abraham to leave the only land he knew. He's to cut ties with his land, with his people, and with his father's household. He's to leave and not to return. How could he do such a thing? Well, there's only one reason, and that is because Abraham had a clear promise from God. Listen to what God said once again. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Remember, God didn't pick Abraham because of who Abraham was. God picked Abraham because what he would do through Abraham, and sometimes even in spite of Abraham. What would God do? He would make Abraham into a great nation. He would bless Abraham. He would make Abraham's name great, and he would bless others through Abraham. Abram had a clear promise from God, but he didn't have a clear destination. Listen to what God said. So the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Could you be a little more precise, God, so I could like plug this into my map app and see just where I'm going? I'd kind of like to know where I'm going before I uproot everything and head somewhere, right? How many of you have ever been kidnapped by family members or friends and they've taken you on a surprise trip somewhere for the weekend? Anybody? A few of you have, right? Now, if you're a type A planner and this happened to you, that probably wasn't easy, was it? You probably had a lot of questions you wanted answered before you were willing to go, like, where are we going? It's a surprise. What do I need to pack? We already packed for you. What about my medicines? They're all packed too. How far are you taking me? You'll find out. How long are we going to be gone? Not too long. 
<laughs> I'm guessing if you are a type A planner, still you probably had a lot of fun when all was said and done. I'm also guessing that even though you didn't know where you were going, you knew you could trust those who were taking you there. Now, it's one thing for family or friends to take you away for a weekend on a fun little adventure. It's another thing for God to take you away for the rest of your life, like he did with Abram. Abram was asked to go not knowing where he was going. He was asked to simply go to a land that God would eventually show him. And because Abram knew God's promises, that was enough. It was enough for him to trust in him, to obey him, and to worship him. In Hebrews 11, 8, it says, By faith, Abraham went, obeyed, and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And then in Genesis 12, you heard, He built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Even though he didn't know where he was going, even though he was called to do something that really didn't make much sense for him and Sarah at that age, because of God's promises, he trusted, and he obeyed, and he worshiped God. Would you do the same if you were in Abraham's sandals? If God called you to leave what's familiar and go to what's unfamiliar, would you trust and obey and worship God? Or would you insist on knowing and agreeing to all the details before you were willing to say, okay, God, I'm ready to follow you? There's definitely things we can learn from Abraham's example, right? And Hebrews 11 not only spells that out for, regarding Abraham, but also Sarah. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So even though he had deep roots in the land of his fathers, because of God's promises, he was willing to pull up those tent pegs and move his tent to the place that God was going to show him. He trusted that one day his earthly tent would be replaced with a heavenly home in a city with eternal foundations. Sarah also went with him, didn't she? And she trusted in God's promise. Hebrews says, And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. As you can imagine, it couldn't have been easy for Abraham and Sarah to make such a journey and to simply trust and obey and to worship God. In fact, they had to wait 25 more years before God finally filled that promise. Abram was 100, and Sarah was 90 when Isaac was finally born. Ladies, how would you like to be 90 when you have your first child? But finally with Isaac, God's promise is starting to be fulfilled, and the rest of the descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Did any of you go on a vacation this year to the beach this summer? Or maybe to some place where you can see the clear night sky? Any of you try to count the grains of sand or the stars in the sky? What God is doing is he's giving us a picture of a huge number of descendants uh, that would be following Abram. But the question is, who are those descendants? Are they simply people who are ethnically connected to Abram? Well, in order to find the answer to that question, what we need to do is understand that this account ultimately is not about Abram. And it's not about him setting an example for how we're supposed to trust and obey and worship him. It ultimately is an account that's pointing us to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, this is how it begins. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So right away, the Gospel of Matthew gives us this condensed genealogy to show us that as we follow Abraham's line long enough, it eventually gets us to Jesus. And then St. Paul makes the connection. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed or his offspring. Scripture doesn't say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So the seed of Abraham, who would be a blessing to all nations, would be none other than our Savior Jesus. 
I don't know about you, but I love meeting Christians from other countries. And part of the reason is because it's a reminder to me constantly of the fulfillment of God's promise here, that all nations would be blessed through Jesus. Now, let me take this a step further to show you how Abraham points us to Jesus. And for this part, I relied on a a brilliant, famous author who often writes articles and blogs for an organization called 1517. You might actually know his name. It's Bob Sunquist. Have you guys ever heard of that? (laughs) So there's a way we can compare and contrast Abraham and Jesus. And so I want to take some of the stuff that he has shared and add some things to it. First of all, God called Abraham and Jesus to leave their home and journey to a land where they would be strangers. So Abraham left his earthly home, (coughs) and then he journeyed to a land where he was a stranger. Jesus left his earthly home and went to a land where he would be a stranger, which is even stranger. Because even though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him or receive him. Here's the next one. Abraham and Jesus obeyed God's call and went. They trusted the one who called them, and they followed his will. But unlike Jesus, Abraham's journey included some delays and detours along the way, and even some disobedience. But ultimately, he obeyed God's call, and he followed him. Here's the next one. Abraham and Jesus both pitched a tent where they went. Abraham pulled up the tent pegs where he was from, and he took that tent with him and put those back in the ground. Well, Jesus left heaven, and he became flesh and dwelt among us. The Gospel of John literally is saying there, Jesus tabernacled or pitched a tent among us. He settled with us for a short time. Abram hung around a tree on a hill near Bethel. Jesus was hung on a tree on the hill of Calvary. So so Abram offered a sacrifice to God on an altar near that tree. Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice to God on the tree of the cross. So through faith in Jesus' saving work, we're children of God, forgiven for all the times we haven't trusted and obeyed and worshiped God as we should have. Through faith in Jesus, we are also children of Abraham, and we are headed to the promised land. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. He says, those who have faith are children of Abraham. And then later on he says, if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So as children of God and as children of Abraham, we have the promise that we are heirs of the promised land of heaven. So if that's true, and God says it is, how does that affect the way you and I live, knowing that our eternity is already secure in Christ? Maybe another way to ask the question is this, how deep are your tent pegs? If you were to check your tent pegs today, what would you find? Could you still pull them out and follow God's call? Or have you pounded them in so deep that you're not going anywhere? When God calls us to pull up our tent pegs and follow him, there are risks, there are unknowns, there are challenges. It's a lot more comfortable and familiar to just stay put inside the tent. But if we do... We can miss out not only on God's blessings to us, but on the blessings that he wants to give to others through us. However, if we trust and obey and worship God, the one who calls us, we will be blessed and we will be a blessing to others in his name. I'm happy to share with you today that Pastor Sam Reinhardt and his wife Athena and little boy Arthur are pulling up their tent pegs in Chicago because they're going to be moving here to Las Vegas. They're going to be joining us in our mission of inviting people to know Jesus. And so we're thrilled that God has led them to be willing to trust and obey him as they join us in ministry here. Now, pulling up your tent pegs doesn't mean you have to go to another state like they are. doesn't mean you have to go to another country. It may mean you just go across the street to a neighbor, or it may mean you go to a different neighborhood. It may mean you get involved in a ministry in the church or in the community. But wherever you go, even if you don't know where you're going, you can trust and obey and follow the one who's leading you there because you know he's always going to be faithful to you and to his promises. And as you trust that the Lord's going to bless you 
and bless others through you, then you can help others to experience a new beginning in Jesus too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Abraham, a man of faith. But more importantly, we thank you for the salvation we have through the gift of faith in Jesus, the seed of Abraham. Help us to be faithful to you, trusting that you will always be faithful to us and to your promises. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.